My name is Kathy Gao, and I am the interviewer, and today I'm speaking with Paul Dostal, who was uh, in the Vietnam War, and this is part of the Hatfield Historical Society's uh, Vietnam Veterans Oral History Grant. And today is Wednesday, June 5th, 2019. So, Paul, if I could have you give us your full name and when and where you were born. Okay, my name is Paul Dostal. I was born in May 1948 in Northampton, Massachusetts. Uh, I was the fifth of nine children, and uh, I grew up in the the, uh, the Bay State section of Northampton. It's a little village between uh, Florence and Northampton, and uh, graduated from Northampton High School in 1966. And uh, after that, I went on to uh, join the Marine Corps at 18, and um, my first duty station after my initial basic training was uh, Marine Corps Recruit Depot in San Diego, California. There was a large uh, communications and electronics battalion there. I said I was going to be a uh, electronics technician. <laughs> At that time, I had, had no idea because during boot camp and our, our post-infantry uh, training after that, we were all told we were going to be infantry and we were going to be Vietnam. But then uh, after a series of tests that you take, uh, Myself and, of course, a number of others were, were selected. They needed people to repair electronics. It turned out that I was a, a radio repairman. Uh, and during my, it was approximately almost a year uh, that I went through different courses of electronics training and radio repair training. And during that time, our instructors, many of whom were, were uh, recent Vietnam veterans, said, you're all going to Vietnam. You're all going to Vietnam. Because at that time, in 1966, 67, was uh, an initial buildup. And uh, so after our training, uh, half of my class went to Vietnam and the other half stayed in the States. And a number of us, about a half a dozen of us, ended up going to uh, my first duty station was uh, Marine Corps Air Station in Yuma, Arizona. Well, the, uh, the aviation uh, electronics and ground electronics were, were two totally different uh, uh, schools of different types of schools and different types of training and we couldn't figure out why we were going there <laughs> and in, in fact uh, I was in a marine air control squadron and we didn't have any of the equipment that I was trained on <laughs> so it, it almost seems like a kind of a, a military mix up or mix something? up or whatever but uh, it, it was kind of interesting so um uh, after a few months, um, I did get orders. Uh, th this was 19, early 1968. Uh, a lot was going on in our country. Uh, Robert Kennedy had gotten assassinated. And uh, I, re I distinctly remember that because I was on a working party that day and, and uh, we were painting some outside lockers for paint storage and flammable storage. And the news c came out, somebody had a transistor radio and it said, Robert Kennedy had been assassinated in Los Angeles, California, and I was just basically down the road in Yuma, Arizona. It was like, what's going on? What, what's happening in our country? Because I recall when John Kennedy got got assassinated. But anyways, uh, so we went off to, uh, I got orders to Vietnam, and uh, the first stop before you went to Vietnam, well, of course, I came home on leave, and my parents didn't say too much. Uh, how long was your leave? Um, our leave was uh, 30 days. And um, I, I'd like to tell one, one more story before. When I, I told my mother I was going to join the Marine Corps, uh, that she said, she, she asked me why. I had two older brothers that were in the Air Force. And I said, uh, well, because I want to go in the Marine Corps. <laughs> and she said, do one thing for me. And I said, okay, what's that, Mom? She said, don't get a tattoo. <laughs> 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 and I thought... Where did my mother come up with this? And finally, after some silence, I said, why not? And she says, just remember, you can't take them off. And I never got a tattoo. And uh, I just, I just, it always stuck with me as a funny story. I thought she was going to say, don't get killed. <laughs> no, she said, don't get a tattoo. <laughs> but, uh, and I used to tell people later on, I, I, became an officer in the Marine Corps, but I would tell my troops when they, they came in as, 
uh, don't get a tattoo. And some people say, well, I'm sorry, sir, it's already already too late. But anyways, that was a side story, which I thought was kind of funny when I was when I was going in the Marine Corps. So uh, uh, have your leave, you're home for 30 days, and then uh, reported to Camp Pendleton, California, and uh, which is out near south of Los Angeles, Oceanside, California. We went through a couple of weeks of what they called staging battalion. So what does was, that mean? It was a uh, it was it was kind of a refresher group in the Marine Corps. Everybody con- is considered an infantryman. It doesn't matter if you're a cook, a baker, a radio repairman, uh, a truck driver, an admin clerk, uh, a, a jet mechanic. We're all considered riflemen. We all we all have to have those basic skills to pick up a rifle and learn how to uh, defend ourselves and defend our particular area of responsibility. And uh, so. We are, we're all lumped into this big company of probably a couple hundred, 250 people or so. So that's the battalion? Uh, no, it was, it was just a company. Company, okay. And, and uh, we went through this uh, different training scenarios, uh, some what they called, they had an assimilated Vietnamese village, a, a training, uh, you know, what, what, a, what a, you know, some bamboo huts and uh, uh, booby traps and, uh, just Vietnam type scenarios that they wanted everybody to be exposed to before they arrived in country. Uh, hiking, uh, some physical conditioning, uh, shooting of the M16 rifle was fairly new at that time. And uh, most of us, where I had come from my previous duty stations, we had uh, our service rifle was an M14. It was a, a, a much heavier weapon. Uh, it worked very, very well, but during the, the Department of Defense came out with the M16. It was a lighter weapon and a smaller, smaller round, and uh, so we were familiar with that, familiarized with that, and then uh, we were given a couple of days off or a day off, maybe like 24 hours worth of liberty. I had a brother at that time that was uh, living in, in uh, up in Anaheim, California, so I went up and visited him and <clears throat> had dinner with him and uh, him and his family and then I went back to Camp Pendleton and then I think the next day we packed our bags and went by bus to March Air Force Base and we all boarded a uh, a large uh, commercial jet it was a it was a charter jet that the, that the military had and I, re- I recall getting on that and it was kind of somber everybody was quiet and uh, we flew from there we we flew to Anchorage Alaska and they said well you can get off the plane but you can't go anywhere. We had to stay right in the terminal. So then the next stop was to get on the plane again, and we flew to uh, Okinawa, Japan. And that was a big staging area for the Marines to go to Vietnam. And uh, and once we got to, uh, I had a couple of buddies that were with me that, had, uh, and they they got they got picked off, and they said, "Well, you're staying in Okinawa." And it was a big. You had the people coming to Vietnam, or that were getting ready to go to Vietnam. And then the others that were coming home. So you had people that were, this was 1968, so you had people that had gone there in 1967. And, you know, they were all, like, to me, they were lean and mean and, and uh, thin. They had that, uh, uh, that, that war look, I guess, if you... If if anybody has studied any history, they see some of the. Well, in 1968, you had all the attacks of the Tet Offensive. Yes, yeah, that was the that was the start. I I was I was not there. That was early 1968. Um, you had the Quezon Offensive that uh, Marines were under attack for I, I think 77 days, and then uh, the the uh, the uh, uh, Way uh, Way City was a very uh, prominent battle for the Marine Corps. But so I got there kind of. Uh, it was night. It was August of 1968. So uh, we were on Okinawa, and we were there was, of course, there was no liberty for us. So we had to stay because they, they kept telling us we we're going to be going out the next day. And I recall uh, finally we uh, we got there, and we they gave us another sea bag. So we left like our, some of our dress uniforms and uh, things that we wouldn't need in Vietnam. We put them in a sea bag, and they I guess they stored them in a warehouse somewhere. And then we packed up and we would drive down to, there was a big, a very large Air Force base, Kadena Air Force Base. And we're down there. It was like, hurry up and wait. Of course, you probably got up at five o'clock in the morning. And and we waited. I remember we waited one day, all day, waiting and waiting. We're going to be leaving in an hour. We're going to be leaving in two hours. We're going to be leaving in three hours. And 
finally the word came down that's oh we're not going and why aren't we going and the, i remember this very distinctly that the we're not going because the plane that left before us had crashed and everybody got killed and everybody's thinking oh what's going to happen so we had to pack all wow. our stuff back up and uh go back up to Camp Hansen, which was probably, it seemed like a, a couple of hour bus ride. And I mean, you have two or 300 Marines that are, and get get all your, you know, get get a bunk and get a linen and get some food and all this kind of stuff, only to do the same thing the next day to turn all your, all your bedding stuff back in, get your sea bag and go back down there. And, and finally we hung around all day and left and uh, got on the plane and it was really quiet on that flight from Okinawa to Vietnam. We were going to land in Da Nang. And as we're circling Da Nang, uh, I was sitting in the middle seat and there was another Marine next to me. Well, I, can't, I, didn't, I didn't know him. I, didn't, I don't remember his name. Uh, and he looked out. We looked out and he could see this red line coming down from the sky. And he goes, look at that. What's that? And I'm looking and I said, I said, that's a helicopter shooting down into the ground and every red line is it's a tracer round I, i'm not sure why he didn't know that but every fifth round out of that machine gun was a tracer so you could see it, it looked like a, just one continuous lit, red line into the ground and we landed at night so it was even even more scary because you couldn't you couldn't see anything you so so the tracer round is like lighting things up right right just so you just can for see like a spotter a spotter round or whatever what like you're that. actually doing yeah well it didn't light it up real light i mean it, it was it was something to to help uh see where your rounds were going mm -hmm. and uh, it was way off in the distance so we landed in da nang and it was hot and muggy and it was about i think it was about 10 o'clock at night and uh we picked got our bag our sea bag and uh, this Marine came, uh, and and he just had a rifle with him. He didn't have a flak jacket on or a helmet or anything, and he, he marched us over some, some tents, and there was just a bunch of cots in there, uh, no bedding or anything, and he just flopped down on the cot, and he tried to get some sleep, and um, I, I don't recall. I, I think we were all so tired. We, I, don't, I don't remember hearing any shots or anything like that. And then the next day we got up, and somebody somebody came. I don't even remember what time it was. Probably seven o'clock or so. And said, "Okay, come on, I'll I'll march you guys to Chow." Got us some Chow, and then we went to a big, uh, I don't know, it's like a type of a warehouse or a big area. And they were they were telling everybody where they were going to go. Of course, I was a radio repairman, so I went, I didn't think I was going to an infantry battalion. They go third amphibious tractor battalion. I had I. I really didn't have a clue, <laughs> but I know that they had the types of radios that I had been trained on. Uh, they they carried that their communications package was a radios that I had so, worked on. So can you tell me here maybe what uh, a amphibious tractor is? Okay, it's uh it's, it was called an LVT P5 landing vehicle tract, and I think the P5 was that that particular model. Mm -hmm. And it was a. Uh, so is that what this is a this plaque is a picture? Yeah, of? this this picture of this plaque that I have in front of me is a is a it was a armor thing, probably weighed twenty tons. It was it was an enormous piece of metal, and uh, and it was used developed during the uh, I guess post or in in World War II because the Marines made a lot of the amphibious landings and you've probably seen some old. Uh, John Wayne movies or World War II movies where the Marines go off a ship and uh, this the front of they land up on the beach and the, the front drops down and everybody starts running out and they're they're shooting their weapons and uh, these were used in in support of, of ground troops uh, operations in in Vietnam and they could they could drive through swamps and drive through you know across rivers and, and things like that we didn't need a bridge or anything like that Whereas the tanks could do some of that, but some of the deeper water, a tank could not go through that. So these were used extensively in, uh, uh, we were, the, the particular base that I was at was south of Da Nang, uh, near a, a place called Marble Mountain. There were two mountains there. One was called Marble Mountain and Chinstrap Mountain. And uh, it was a, a real sandy area, a real uh, beach area, beautiful beaches. And we were right on the edge of the beach. Of course, we had a big uh, perimeter of our, our whole battalion area, which was 
had barbed wire and concertina wire and we had towers and all that kind of stuff and bunkers and that sort that sort of thing uh and uh so were you ever in one of those I oh mean, yes yes uh, so when i got there i got sent to the uh it's called Head- headquarters and service company and we they were the basically the support element for the base our base and so we i was in the communications maintenance platoon where we had a we had a small uh a small shop so if the radios and these things didn't work they would bring them up to us and we we would fix them or try to fix them and uh we also fixed the uh, the backpack radios it was called the PRC portable radio uh C25 a prick 25 is common terminology big big long antenna on it and uh you see a lot of uh uh you know the, the the radio operator was always with his lieutenant uh and and they had that big antenna whipping around so you heard all these stories about you know the first the first thing that the the vc or the nva was they they saw that antenna and they were going to start shooting in that area because they knew that was the radio operator and that was the lieutenant so uh uh did they get rid of those antennas after that? Well, they they could you could bend them down. They had a couple. They had some that were really long, and then they had some that were like a uh, almost like a tape measure type thing, uh, and and you could bend it over. And then they had a shorter one. So, but I mean that was more for the infantry to use it. But we had we had them in our battalion, and mainly the radios. And they actually had a version of this uh, of the Amtrak that was a a command a command version and it was just loaded with radios so that maybe the battalion commander could use that as his communications uh center to to uh speak to all of his uh company commanders and all of his his staff uh and if we were out on some a particular type of operation or whatever but sometimes you were actually in the water with these yes well we we well, well later on when I first went there I was in this uh, H&S company for several months and then um over, during the course of they would send out groups to support a, what they called a battalion landing team and it was made up of infantry and artillery and tanks and uh uh, uh and a, you know helicopter group and of course an amp Am, amtrak troop and during vietnam with the advent of the helicopters uh they did they did a lot of they did amphibious landings, but they did a lot of helicopters. You see, you've probably seen them on uh, on the news or in stories where they're they're flying the Marines off the helicopter off the helicopter ships uh, and uh, and making a landing on on land. And they could they could it was quicker, it was faster, uh, but we still did amphibious landings, and these were uh, an integral part of that. And so we did go off the ship. You know, the Marines would come over uh, on our, I was on the USS Alamo um, uh, for a while, and we would make these amphibious landings. We would bring infantry people ashore, go on an operation with them. But um, to back up, when I first got there, so I was in, H, in this H&S company, and, and we were responsible for, uh, you know, uh, repairing the radios. But we had also other responsibilities, and that included perimeter security uh going out on patrols around our area and uh it was relatively quiet when we when i first got there my first my first couple of weeks you didn't you didn't know what to expect the first thing you know they they, they gave you all this they gave you a flak jacket and a helmet and all your all your uh you know your cartridge belt and magazines and all this kind of stuff I, we call it our 782 gear and uh what does that mean? Seven eighty two. It was just a, a just a terminology for for the equipment that everybody carried, and uh, I, uh, so uh, after about two weeks we were there, it was relatively quiet. And my perspective at that time was like, you know, when when I when I had to ride from Da Nang when I first got there, I, I know it was a Saturday morning, and. Uh, <clears throat> I'm thinking we're going to leave the Da Nang Air Base, which, which was a massive air base, and drive out into who knows where. And no weapon, no helmet, no flak jacket. I'm thinking, what's going to happen? We're just driving down the road, and this is your first exposure. And, and of course, there's civilians that are walking down the road, and the, people, the women and men in their 
uh, most of them are dressed in black, like black pajamas and the bamboo hats and things. And you're thinking, somebody's going to shoot us. And, and anyways, it was it was kind of a little bit frightening at, at first. And uh, so we go through this little village. And next thing you know, there's there's our area, 3rd third, third Amphibious Tractor Battalion, you know. Uh, go through the gate and you get a check-in and you get a sign. And the first thing they do is they give you... All, all this stuff, your protective, you know, a, a flak jacket and a helmet and all the other stuff that you need that Marines traditionally carry and uh, take you down, get, get you a weapon. And the first thing you do is you go down and fam fire that weapon to make sure that it's functional and that you know what the heck you're doing with that weapon. And and then uh, then you have to go back and clean it. And, and you kept your weapon right with you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So next to your bed when yeah, you're sleeping. Yeah, right, it was like, and then, and then I was assigned to a... a well, we called them hooches. It was basically a uh, a platform with some some plywood up about three or four feet, and then some screen, and then a metal roof. And uh, uh, there was a bunch of I don't think there was ten or twelve of us in there, and we just had a cot. And uh, you had so you a, just uh, slept on a cot the whole slept, time. Slept slept on a cot for for that particular time while I was assigned to that that particular unit. And then uh, we had a formation every single day. A, a rifle inspection every single day. Uh, they also made us take uh, uh, some salt tablets and uh, malaria tablets once a week. And um, uh, I know some people got sick from them. I, I didn't have any effects or anything like that. And then, uh, so then you, you kind of went, you went in, and you kind of went to work, went to this shop, and you started learning how to, you know, repair these these things. But after about I was there about two weeks and uh we also we had trained for this during that course There's, and uh of course it always happens at night uh if something was gonna if we were gonna get attacked that you got your helmet and your flak jacket and your rifle and, and we were assigned assigned to a particular squad and uh we were gonna rendezvous at a we had bunkers near our where we slept and things like that and, and sure enough one night we started getting a rocket attack it was very scary because there's explosions. There's like a siren going off. People are running around, and you're trying to think, what the heck, where, you know, what's going on? And you were just kind of following the others that were in your group, and then you were assigned to part of the perimeter. And uh, we had gotten several attacks. Uh, and, uh, like in fact, our, our shop, which was located not where we lived, it was, you know, a ways away had gotten pretty damaged by by some of these things and uh and then for the next week or two we we went out on did our did what marines do we went out outside our battalion area and we're looking for the the source of these attacks and patrolling and uh going out and looking for the either Viet Cong or North Vietnamese uh army and uh getting into a couple of firefights uh which was like very very scary for you you know the the bullets are whizzing by and you're just thinking how am i going to get out of this but uh anyways and then you know we'd come back and we'd try to get some food and we did have a mess hall where we had hot food um so what kind of food did you have well they had they had pretty much uh uh you know whatever you had in the states uh, right so they're giving you mostly american food yeah, we, versus oh yes Vietnamese yeah food. yeah we 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 had all americans um uh, you know we had we had marine cooks that were cooking the food um you know uh i i can remember they 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 used to bake bread which was sliced i, I kind of like that and uh you know just i mean did you like had things like hamburgers and hot dogs well no i don't recall many hamburgers and, you, know, you know they had uh um I remember having pork chops, chicken. Uh, I guess it was some kind of beef. We called it mystery meat, but it was probably kind of, kind of, probably kind of came out of a can. And sometimes we did we did have to rely on on sea rations, which were a, a small box that had you know a, a main meal in it, a fruit, and uh, um, a, a pound cake type thing, some gum. They all had cigarettes in them. I didn't. I was not a smoker, so I would. I would trade my trade mine for uh, 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 you know the sugar, the salt, uh, 
but the cigarettes, I was not a smoker, so I would trade for maybe a can of peaches or a pound cake or cocoa or, or now, whatever. Now, when you say the sea rations had fruit, I mean, it's not like fresh well, fruit, No, right? no, 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 a can. Yeah, Everything a can. was canned or packaged, right. yes. So yeah. canned peaches or right. pears or right. exactly. something like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so, um, so did you have any um, ones that you particularly liked more than the others? Um, the pork and beans, uh, spaghetti and meatballs weren't bad. The big thing was is everybody would... Uh, uh, they, had, they had a hot sauce in the mess hall, like Frank's hot sauce. I don't know what it was called, but if it was Frank's or what it was, and they had. So you would try to get some, take a bottle of that out of out of the mess hall to doctor these things up because some of them, <laughs> the worst ones were ham and lima beans, and everybody will tell you they had a. They they used to call them ham and M- mfers, <laughs> and uh, they didn't they didn't like you know nobody liked those. Uh, did, did you know what was in your sea ration? Like, did they say on the outside? Yeah, like there was a, usually a thing. It was they mm. were they were labeled. Uh, what what usually what was, what the main course was, was or something? What it was, yeah. But, but everything came in one little David uh, uh, box. And uh, so, I mean, did you get to pick? Well, was sometimes like you did, and sometimes and... you didn't. Sometimes you got a case of box, and it, it depended upon you know if if you were the one that was handing them out. You you well, I'm, I think I'll have pork and beans, and I put a can of pork and beans by my by my in my pocket or something <laughs> or close to me so and then I would hand just hand out randomly hand them out or sometimes you just walk by and stuck your hand in and grab the box and that was it but um and we had uh so we would go out we had two little villages near us one was called like I, I don't know why I remember this but it was called Nui Kim San and that particular village was uh we would have to go through there to go to the main road and to go out to where we used to patrol and go out to where the, the uh, Marble Mountain was. And then uh, there was another one uh, a little ways away, and it was called Zamzam Tui, and it was a leper village. It was like a leper colony, and there was a big barbed wire fence around it. And, uh, and as soon as you went outside the gate and got a little ways away from your perim- perimeter, um, the kids would start coming running out, and I have a I have a photo here. Uh, this was one day I was on a on a patrol, and all these kids came out. Somebody took a picture of, of me with the kids, and you know they were probably eight, nine, ten years old. Is that you? That's me, <laughs> and you can see Marble Mountain in the background. But here they are smoking cigarettes. <laughs> Like this guy, and they're like six, eight years old. Yeah, or something. I, I'd say that between you know five, six, five, seven, eight, nine, yeah. tens. Give me money. Give me Sigmo. Give me candy. Give me, give me. They wanted food, really, what they wanted, but they liked to smoke cigarettes. And it was, I got the biggest kick out of that. I said, you shouldn't be smoking cigarettes. But now, did they speak English or? Oh yeah, they they, yeah. they kind of spoke spoke broken English, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, GI, you number one, you number one, you number one. They were always telling us that we were. That we were number one, and uh, especially if you're trying to get candy, yeah, or cigarettes. Start trying, they're trying yeah. to butter you up for for something, but you know, and they and we we had been told about you know just be careful about people coming up to you and trying to give you something because they might be having a soda can and it might have a might have a booby trap in it, uh, uh, and our uh, repairing of all these radios and but we had batteries. Some the PRC twenty fives they relied on a, a, a battery pack primitive battery pack compared to what they have now but it had batteries in it uh, we couldn't throw any wire away so so when we worked we had to burn everything why because they didn't want that battery or that wire or anything electronic getting in the hands of uh we, we had a dump not too far from uh i, I only went once because uh, we had different every day you would, somebody was assigned to a working party and uh and it was going around we were picking up the base trash and uh, but our stuff they didn't want us putting it in the trash because the viet the vc were and the vietnamese people they were very very um uh i can't think of the term industrious industrious in terms of using whatever material they had they were very very poor i mean they they really didn't have much in terms of they didn't have a you drive up and down Main Street here, and you see all these big houses, or or, or, or just the house in in the United States. They had a little shack, and there was probably no running water. There was no bathroom. 
Uh, they had maybe a little area for for cooking. It was it was. Would they have floors and things? They or? were dirt floors and thatched roofs and things like that. And uh, it was just it was a it was a to me it was like a really it was a very poor country. And so you also mentioned something about um, using trash sometimes, like for booby traps. Yes. So so they are our uh, sergeant, gunnery sergeant that was in charge of us, he said, you know, we're not going to throw anything away because we, we found that oh, through, before I had gotten there, I'm sure over the course of the time that they were there, that that the, uh, the Vietnamese being very industrious and got into the, to, to the wrong hands, they could, they could use that wire to trigger a booby trap or to make a snare trap or to make a make a, some kind of thing, something to injure, you know, the Americans. So our trash, which was mostly the electronic stuff, wire, batteries, uh, any types of metal things, we would burn it. And we had a big hole by where our shop was. And we used to, we used to have a, like a fire every day, or not every day, once a week or whatever. But, I mean, you guys weren't saving those pieces of wire to oh, no, use no, no. because you had new stuff. You could... Yeah, yeah, if you were replacing something, but you didn't want them to get it, to, right. to use it against us. And uh, and and so we would go out. I, I remember having a, being assigned to a working party for this particular day, and we had to go around and pick up all the trash. It was on a big, like a big six-by truck. It was a big type dump. I mean, a, not, a, not really a dump truck. It was a, it didn't, the bed didn't raise, but it was a big, big truck. And we took it out to this area outside our battalion, and you know it was it was just you know garbage and uh, waste. And the Vietnamese would be picking through it as fast as we could get it off the truck. I mean, they were looking for food, they were looking for wood, they were looking for anything that they could Metal, thought they anything. could use. A, yeah. You know, an old pair of maybe somebody threw a pair of socks away. I, anything that was they they were so industrious or so. Use, but they wanted this stuff that was of be of you know, s- s- your, your trash is someone else's treasure, <laughs> yeah. So, you, you had to be careful over there. But, um, so, um, then after that period, there was seemed to be a kind of a lull. But at, at night, we were assigned to guard the perimeter of the of our area, not on every night. We had different duties, our duty sections would go. So, uh, if you were in duty section one, you might have duty tonight and then a couple of days later you'd have it again and and there were usually three or four of you assigned to uh, uh a foxhole a fighting hole uh, it was actually a, a big bunker so even though you're doing radio repair right you're still have yes to do you your still had your all your mili- and you military might be in a duties foxhole right with your weapon exactly exactly or um uh, and uh there was a month or, or six weeks or so that um, everybody was on, on, got assigned to additional duties. Uh, I got assigned to guard duty, so I was a squad leader, and uh, had twelve other guys with me, and we would go out. Uh, it was we'd go out. We'd go out from I think it was like six or seven o'clock at night till six or seven o'clock in the morning, and we'd go out. We'd go out on a patrol in our outside of our perimeter area. And are, so are you in vehicles or walking? No, no, we were walking. Walking. Walking patrol with a radio operator, myself, and uh, like three fire teams with, uh, 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 I don't think, I don't remember. We all had M16s, a flak jacket, helmet, you know, going out there looking for, for something, for, for someone trouble. that wasn't supposed to be where they were supposed to be at, at night. And, uh, and then you would come back in. Get something to eat, debrief. I used to have to go in and debrief the operations chief or whatever he was, and say what we saw, what we did, and then, you know, they they were always getting intelligence in. We think, you know, there's some activity over here. You want to, and, and then, so then you'd have you'd have off from seven o'clock in the morning, and then uh, you'd go back out again. You did that for a couple of days, and then you you kind of switched. There was there were several several. Uh, squads that would go out so well so while you were in resting they were out there and then you would flip-flop so sometimes you were out from 7 a.m to 7 p.m or whatever it was you go out for about 12 hours at a time and then come back and 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 if you were out at night uh the area around which was the road into our battalion you had to wait until the um 
they had these uh, what they called engineers. They would come out with mine sweeping equipment to make sure that nobody had placed a mine inside where we were going to be walking through because you don't know. I mean, you you, you didn't have the eyes and ears to to see every single thing. You know, that whole time you were gone. So sometimes you'd be out there and. You know, we're, you'd be talking on the radio. Uh, we're ready. To, we're coming back in. They said, well, you can't come in because the road hasn't been cleared yet. Because they would set booby traps for the Jeeps. Uh, the other thing, uh, they, they would set the booby traps for these amphibious tractors. They got pretty pretty smart because they figured out that the fuel storage for the, for the Amtraks, the gas, was, uh, was on the bottom. They were these big bladders. And so if they could... They could set up an explosive device, a mine or a, a, land, a land mine or a booby trap to, to blow these, blow this thing up. You could, these Marines got very, very serious seemingly because you had, you know, I, I don't rec- I don't know how much fuel they had on them, but it was a lot. And these things would catch on fire and people would get very, very, very seriously injured, burned, and killed and exploded. These also had a, uh, uh, a 30 caliber machine gun on top so you had ammunition and fuel you had sometimes you had ammunition inside so they figured out that if they could stop this they were you know doing damage to americans and uh so you had to wait in the morning i recall waiting sometimes up to an hour and you're just sitting out there you know you're hungry you're tired you, you want to get back in and you know, get something to eat and go to bed. Now, your 12-hour shift, though, I mean, yes. are you eating while you're out? While you, like, are you have sea rations well, with you well, and you're uh, able to eat? Or? No, not, I, I don't remember it. You know, you had, you had water. Presumably but you had water, right? You know, some people may, may have had something to eat. I don't, I don't remember like really taking too much. Like stuff your pockets Yeah, or stuff something. something in your pocket. You know, I mean, I didn't have a granola bar. Right. <laughs> yeah. Protein bars, yeah. everybody, you know. Yeah. Um, so, uh, what sort of thing did you guys do for, you know, recreation when okay, you had time uh, off? Well, we had a, like I said, we had a, we had a beach. We were right, right on that beach, and uh, they had they had they had swim hours a few hours, a few days a week, um, and we worked every day. Uh, well, except Sunday, we used to work six days a week, and um, maybe get off early, a little bit early on Saturday afternoon. Uh, we did have uh, in our battalion area. We had a, we had a small club, uh, maybe the size of this room here. Um, you could get two beers. Uh, I think beer was fifteen cents, so that was that was pretty good. So, what kind of beer do you remember? Uh, I remember Schlitz. Um, I think they had Budweiser. I, I, there was probably other stuff, but so it's not like you could get drunk because no, no. everybody could only get two beers. Yeah, but sometimes you would go. And you would say that, well, I'm with those four guys on that table. So you might only have you and your buddy would be there. And so you would go up and say, well, I want four beers. Well, well, who who, who are you with? And, um, well, those four guys over there. So there's two for me, you know. So you go up and get eight beers. And, and uh, not very often, but, you know, they were kind of. But you could. You could get you around could, it you a could, little bit. There were, there were ways to get around it. And uh, there was also a. Uh, uh, but they only served it maybe from like not very long, and then it was shut off. And they they sometimes they had a movie, and you had to wait till it started to get dark, a little bit dark. So they, and they projected it on a. I guess we had like a, a little stage out there, and a, a, I don't know. It seemed like a, a white board, or maybe it was some sheets or something. And there would be a movie, but not 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 every night. Or and then uh, I remember. It, uh, we had some. We had a football. We used to pass around. We had a beach area. Uh, a lot of people played cards, wrote letters. Uh, Did you write letters? Oh yeah, wrote letters to my my parents. And uh, I, I didn't have a girlfriend, so uh, I never really wrote mostly to my parents. And uh, you said your brother was in the navy. Yeah, I had a brother that was Did in the navy. Did you ever write to him? Oh yeah, he was. He was I, actually. He was there shortly after I got there. Um, he was a. a uh, on a, on a, uh, he was a naval flight officer. And he was on an aircraft carrier. In fact, I, I got to run into him twice, uh, once in Japan and once in the Philippines. And um, so he took me to dinner at the. He was an officer, so 
for me being an enlisted guy to, to go to dinner at the officers club was was pretty special and uh met a bunch of his friends and things and um um uh, and then he went uh, this was later on when i went on a on this ship and uh our ship happened to be in the philippines and we were we were there like say on a on a thursday and he came in on on a thursday so i saw him i think it was a thursday night and then we left friday morning the next day and so it's it was fun to get so i would write to my brother and my my parents mostly and my and did they write to you oh yeah my parents would would write back my mother would, would was pretty um uh regular diligent regular mm -hmm. about writing letters and uh, so what was it like to get letters? I mean, it was it was a big it was a morale booster because you wondered what what was going back at home. Wonder what was going back going on back at home. Um, they did also they had armed forces uh, network um, radio uh, station. So some people had uh, transistor radios. Um, uh, so were you able to listen to music? You could, you could listen to music. Somebody always had a like a like a. A, a boom box if you will some people had tapes uh and uh somebody had a television somewhere so you could you could see some they would they would have tv i can remember one was combat that was on and i think some westerns were on from time to time uh they also had church services on sunday which uh, I'm, i was catholic I, I am still catholic i i attended that not not all the time but I, I did attend that. So did it seem like um, having a religious background was helpful for w when you were over there? Or? Well, you, you know, I, I think so. I think when everybody gets into a, a, a tight situation, you you think, um, you know, you, you want to pray to somebody, you know, and you're, you're, you're praying that you want to get out of here alive. And, you know, you're, um, you know, you think about that. You think a lot of a lot of different things. You think, you think, well, when I get back home, I'm going to do this different and that different, and you know, because you, you never know. And uh, uh, when I first got there, in fact, I have my dog tags with me, my original dog tags that I had in Vietnam, my old service number, and uh, they have your name and your initials, your service number, your uh, USMC, what religion you were. I was Catholic. They have your blood type. And they Hopefully have, they had yours right because I guess yes, they had they, Jerry Clark's yeah. wrong. Oh really? So uh, it was blood type B, and they had an M on, on them, and that was for your gas mask size. And I don't know why they put that on there, but uh, so, anyways, when I got there, I saw these guys in my 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 hooch that we lived in, and and a bunch of them were wearing either just a bullet on a, on a chain. Or they had their dog tags, and I'm going. This was kind of interesting. I said, "What's that all about?" And as I recall, that somebody said, "Well, if if you're wearing this, this is like a good luck charm. This this bullet is that you bullet already got your neck. bullet. So is that a real bullet? This is from an M16 round. Okay, because they're small. And yeah, they're not very big, and uh, so we took took that out and uh, had a hunk of wire and you soldered that thing in there and so you, been you already had your since? bullet so you didn't have to worry about it was like a i don't know talisman or something some or... kind of a charm so and then uh i just i always kept it so hmm. anyways um so i wanted to just kind of jump sure. back like so why did you decide to enlist um you were what 18? Yes, I was 18. Just uh, graduated from high just school. Just graduated from high school. And I wasn't sure what I was going to do. Uh, being from a large family, my, my parents, uh, my, my mom was a stay-at-home mom with nine kids. And uh, my dad worked uh, at the Pro Brush Company in Florence. And he, he worked at night and worked at the Florence Diner. He sold shoes. He worked in a pack. I mean, he was always working, doing something. And um, I, I knew that they couldn't afford to send me to college. And I, I just felt that I wasn't ready at that particular time. So I decided to go to volunteer. I had no idea what I was getting into. I know that I had, uh, so my dad was, was uh, during, he was already late in his late, I might have been 30 uh, when World War II broke out. And so, and he was married with three children. And uh, my mother was pregnant with another one. <laughs> so, uh, he was not going. He did not go into service, although he did help with, I think, some Red Cross stuff and 
um, you know, the, uh, oh, if, if there was ever going to be a drill on your street or something, I think right. he was one of right. the, the people that was, was going to help with that. So, but I did have, um, two older brothers that were in the service and I thought, I, I guess maybe I'll go in the service. And, um, uh, uh, I mentioned the story about my mother with the tattoo, and I had, I, I had five uncles that were in World War II, and Marines, Army, and the Navy, and uh, I used to hear them them talking a little bit about it, but uh, not very much. So I just, and then I had friends that were in the service, and I thought, well, I'll go in the service. For I joined for three years, and when I get out, I'll go to college and see what happens, or. Well, we'll just see where that that next step takes me. But I, it was just a sense of volunteerism, and I thought it was, um, I thought I thought like many other like the, like all of us Vietnam veterans that we were just following in our fathers or forefathers' footsteps. That it was now it's now it's our generation. Right. We we have to raise our right hand and and support and defend the Constitution. And uh, we all thought we were doing the at that particular time, or at least I did. I thought, okay. We're doing the right thing in in Vietnam, and uh, so through the eyes of an eighteen year old, you looking for adventure and get away from home. And uh, oh, I'm out of school. I think, man, this is going to be great. I won't have any more school. Boy, was I shocked when I ended up going to school for almost a year in the Marine Corps. So, <laughs> I, I, right then and there, I, I learned that your 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 training, your learning, and school never stops, never stops for anybody. So. My advice to young people is, is you know, do it, do the best you can because it, it it never stops. You never stop learning, and and it was so rightly, rightfully so. So um, that was that was my my background on why I I had joined. Right. So what was it like when you came back, and what was you know, what was the scenario? Well, when we came back. Uh, I can I can remember I I came back to uh, flew back to uh, Travis Air Force Base, and we were bussed down to um, I, I only had like maybe a month left in the Marine Corps, so I wasn't gonna get I was gonna be I, I they stamp your orders relad release from active duty when you get back because they weren't gonna send me to some duty station for a, a month or whatever it was, and uh, we got we got sent down to Treasure Island, in, in San Francisco, and. Uh, it was just a, a joy to to uh, be around people and and uh, not have to be afraid. You or... didn't have to be worried about getting shot at, or you didn't have to worry about um, you know just just it, it, almost like a, a relief was relif- lifted off your back. However, um, there were people. Uh, it didn't really happen to me, but I had a lot of friends that I didn't come through San Francisco airport or airport or anything, but you know, you were, you know, they were very disrespectful to us because at that time, a year at, at 68 and 69 was, it was just so much. You came back in 69. I, I, 1969. So you didn't want to wear your uniform off base. I, I had some, you know, I had civilian clothes. So, um, and you had, you had short hair. Everybody, especially in the San Francisco area, there was, you know, the that was the height of the the hippie movement, and everybody had long hair. And uh, uh, so I, I I stayed there. I I got discharged, and I had a brother in Southern California, and I went to see him. And then my brother, that was in the Navy, was also uh, he was actually stationed in Alameda, California, and uh, I, I visited with him for a couple of weeks and then I had another brother um, who had um, recently got transferred he worked for John Hancock and he got transferred to uh, Seattle Washington and so uh, I said well, I'm going to go up there and I had a good friend of mine that I was in Vietnam with who was from from uh, Tacoma Washington and so I went up and saw him and uh, you know we wanted to drink beer and uh, raise more, hell more than two more, more, more than two beers and uh, uh, my brother showed me around Washington State, and I'm uh, not Washington State, but like downtown Seattle and Tacoma. And uh, I remember going out to uh, out out to Mount Rainier, but um, didn't really talk too much about saying, you know, I just got back from Vietnam. I just tried to get back, and then I I came back here to to my parents' house, and 
got enrolled in college. That was in Florence. Florence, yep, yeah. Uh, first, when I when I first got back, and I I uh, I had two friends. Well, I had a, one of my friends who was in Vietnam before me was working for a surveying outfit. And I said, I said, hey, they got any jobs? So I, I immediately went back into the work work mode. I worked in November and December and part of January. And uh, then I went and I started going to college for uh, full time. But um, And where did you go to college? I went to start out at Holyoke Community College mm -hmm. and uh, then worked uh, in the summertime, went back to, it was a surveying outfit. And so uh, Elmer Huntley Associates in Northampton, I, I'm not sure if they're they're not in North. I I don't know. I think the I think he retired. He may have been passed on, but it was it was it was kind of a fun job because you were outside. And uh, but I I didn't I didn't carry any any weight or have any uh, didn't feel bad about what I had done. I just uh, tried to put it back. If somebody asked me, I told them what had happened. And but I didn't I didn't wear it on my sleeve so to speak um i just i said i gotta get on with my life and this is what i'm gonna gonna do so um it was it was an interesting time <laughs> and um but uh but I, when i look back now 50 years later i think um we really i really didn't know much <laughs> as an 18 or 20 year old kid that, that i know now and i when I watch the news now, I, I think about, we're talking about the latest Iran business and Venezuela and North Korea, and I'm thinking, whoa, let's stop and think about what you're doing because if no one's ever been in that situation, um, it, it's a horrific. It's horrific for people. And, uh, you know, right, not to uh, be entered lightly. Yeah, and um, I, have, I, had, I didn't serve with them, but uh, two of my high school friends, um, Leonard Danline and Larry Savino got killed in Vietnam, Eight, 18, 19, 19, 20 years old. And um, I think I think about those guys, and it's they never had a chance. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to go quick check who's up with the door. Okay. I'm not expecting anybody, and we're pretty much out of time okay we've already gone like an hour yeah but we could talk another hour i know okay. we could <laughs> I know. but anyway i wanted to have you like at least show me like the shorts okay and just talk about that because that'll go through the different places that you were stationed yep. okay um and then if there's like just anything else i mean i know we like didn't cover so much right. but if there's anything else um we'll just so we're, we're back on here talking with paul docile again uh, so what's this picture you're showing okay, me? Okay, I have a photo here of uh, myself in front of an Amtrak. Um, that was on an operation we were on um, south of Da Nang um, in February, March. Is, is time. that the part that opens up that yeah, you Yeah, this is the of? gate. I'm sitting on the front ramp mm -hmm. that, would, that would open up. And you can see here, <laughs> there's a case of sea rations. <laughs> <laughs> and on this particular operation, I can recall, uh, we would be... Uh, we were we were out in the woods. It was like being out in the woods, and there's just nothing out there. And it's not so much jungle. It was uh, hedgerows and some rice paddies and and um, just not a lot. It wasn't it wasn't really thickly heavily heavy jungle, but um, there was no one around. And every once in a while, you would come onto a a small a small little vill, and there were there were there was nobody there except young children uh, and, and older women, the mothers uh, and old men. No, I would say there was no men between, like say 15, 16 to uh, my perspective, you know, anybody over 25 was an old man, but uh, you know, probably late, probably 20s and 30s, but they were very old people. And, and you know, we'd go looking through, looking for weapons, looking for uh, anything that, any signs of, you know, store large cases of food or weapons or rockets or anything, and I know we, I recall rounding these people up and the inter interrogators would come and talk to them, but it was it was, uh, and and we would get supp resupplied every few days, not every day, but we subsisted on sea rations for 
quite a long time, but we would get a hot meal would be flown in by a helicopter. They would bring in these vats with hot food in it that I guess came from the ship. And uh, we, uh, so we had, we had a hot meal. Maybe and presumably the hot meal from the ship in the vat was better than the sea rations. Yes. Yeah. Cause you got, um, kind of got sick of eating that. Um, but like I said, uh, and sometimes they brought out fresh fruit, you know, some oranges and apples and things of that nature. But um, the one one particular thing that I used to like was uh, I would take hot chocolate and there was creamer in there. And, uh, and uh, they had these little heat tabs, but they didn't work so hot. So we used, uh, we had plastic explosive, it was called C4. And that would that would burn, and it would heat up that your cup with that hot chocolate in it. And and sometimes it would be raining, and it was, I mean, at, once the sun went down, it got damp and cold, and it was nothing like a a nice. I, I didn't drink coffee, so I I would make this concoction of water and the, the cocoa and the cream and the sugar, and it was it was warm your so right up. So how much <clears throat> how much C four did you need to heat it up? Well, you not just like needed a little uh, burn your maybe, uh, hand up. <laughs> You needed a, a little chunk of it, maybe the size of a, a half a dollar or a quarter or whatever. And I mean, it burned fast and it, it gave that instant burst of heat. So, <laughs> so we were, we also became, you became very adaptive at, you know, taking care of yourself out in the field and, you know, washing up in a well or a stream or whatever. Okay. So, uh, you may want to continue talking about that or something else, but I was going to ask you if you could show me your shorts yep. and describe them. So I have a... It's hard to believe I was this skinny, but I think I weighed about 135 pounds when I was in Vietnam. And uh, so anyways, uh, they as, as morale boosters, the... the Red Cross, the Special Services, uh, Marine Recreation and Welfare Fund. If you, I'm not sure if that's what they called it then, but you know they handed out like shirts or T-shirts, and uh, uh, I, I'm not sure if they handed these out. This is a, a what we call them tiger shorts. It's like a little bathing suit, and uh, compared to the shorts today, they're they, they they seem like they're pretty skimpy. So. Uh, I had them and I used them as a bathing suit or. But they're kind of like a camo yeah, design. Yeah, they're, they're camel, you know? camel uh, pair of uh, uh, material, and they had an adjustable little belt strap on here and and uh, a pocket in the back. No pockets in the front or anything. And for some reason, uh, uh, so I I had them. I must have worn them back in the states because I I can see that there's a, a patch job on here, which my mother was an excellent seamstress, so she. <laughs> <laughs> she probably tried to salvage them for me, but anyways, I wrote into them. Uh, so this is on the inside, on the inside, like on the back, uh, you know, I, side. I, I labeled my all my clothes when I got there, uh, and my my boots. I have a pair of jungle boots here, but I put Dostal Paul S. Vietnam, nineteen sixty eight, sixty nine, and the, the the different outfits that I was with, and, and uh, one is H and S Company, third third Amtrak Battalion, and then I was transferred to B Company, third. Amtrak Battalion, and that's the unit. Uh, part of that unit went out on a what they called a battalion landing team, which was made up of all the elements uh, of a of a you know the, uh, the air air wing and the infantry and the armor, which included tanks and um, different support groups to support. There's about I think around eighteen or two thousand. Marines and we were assigned to a ship. Wow! And they weren't all on that same ship. There was like a landing platform and a couple other ships, troop transport type ships, and we were positioned off the coast of Vietnam. And then we would go and make various amphibious and is this landings. Like near Da Nang, or oh well, yeah, it would, anywhere's from. Uh, I don't think we went down. We were probably more than in, more in Northern I Corps, what they called Northern I Corps. So, so from uh, this. Uh, I don't know which one's easier. Yeah, on your map here, uh, we were up up here from the anywhere's from the DMZ down to uh, down by Chu Lai and, and Quang Nai. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's how you pronounce it. But we would patrol, go up and down here. Uh, we did we did land some infantry up near uh, the 
the DMZ one time and just we just dropped them off and stayed on the beach for a couple days and then we went back on the ship and then we would go down here and make an amphibious landing. And so where was your base where you were well, most of the time? Well, I was just south of, of uh, Da Nang. Uh, it's not on here, but it was a, a very, very small area, uh, five or six miles, uh, I think, from Da Nang Air Base. It was, like I said, the, the, two, the two mountain areas there are uh, uh, most Marble Mountain and, and Chinstrap Mountain. And and just north of us was, uh, uh, I think it was the first Marine Air Wing. They were at uh, Marble Mountain Air Facility, and then right next to us. And then then there was a Special Forces Army camp that was near them. And then there was us. And then uh, next to us was a uh, a Navy CB base, and uh, they had it made because they had a bar over there. <laughs> And they were always wanting to trade. They would want jungle boots. They would want camouflage utilities. Uh, I went over there a couple times. So with, when you say utilities, you mean like, clothes? Like these dungarees, yeah. these, mm -hmm. you know, the working uniform that we wore on a, on a, on a daily basis, uh, a poncho liner. But, but they would say, if you guys come back, you know, we can give you a quart of whiskey and you give us a, some, so, you know, we're always bartering <laughs> and trying to, trying to trade for different things. But not all the time. I, like I said, I, I think I only went there once. Uh, one other highlight, well, it wasn't a highlight, but I can remember at Christmas time, um, uh, Bob Hope show was in Da Nang at the Air Force Base. And so our commander said, hey, if anybody wants to go down there, you guys can go. And I remember going down there, and it was just, it's just like on the movie, on, on what you see on, on television. When you see Bob Hope coming out, and there's just all these, all of us guys, all the service members are out there, and he's telling jokes, and he's got his golf club, and I can't recall who the the I don't know if it was Ann Margaret, and you know all the all his troop that's with him. It was just, it was like you were so, you were a part of something special, even though it wasn't special. But being away from at Christmas time, you're really you're my first time away from Christmas in my whole life, and yeah. Uh, it was, it, he really, he really reached you guys. He really reached everybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think about it and uh, it's just, it's kind of hard to describe. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, the whole thing, I mean, all this stuff you've been telling me, I mean, I have a 21 year old son who's still, you know, he's a young adult, but he's still pretty much a kid. And yeah. you were there when you were 20, 20 years old. Yeah. I mean, basically the same age and having to do all this yeah. and on well, a daily basis. I mean, it's what we did. And there yeah. was, uh, I was just one of hundreds of thousands of us that had served. And uh, I mean, I didn't, I didn't get any special awards. I didn't do any horrific, I mean, her heroic actions. I, and I'm, I'm like, I, I consider myself like many other military members what doesn't matter what branch you served you did your job you did you what you were told to do some of us gave a lot more and uh, some of us just went and did what we had to do and came home and got on with our lives and um, I just appreciate everybody for what they did so and then um, so once we were I was assigned to going back to this amp track business, uh, we were assigned to a, this battalion landing team. So we were, you know, kind of transferred from our land base to a, to a uh, sea based. And then they just, they were just different names for them. And, uh, and you were transferred to another battalion with, I was a third battalion, 26 Marines for a short time. Uh, that particular battalion was, was up at, uh, at the DMZ when there was an early 1968. And then they, once they moved out of there, they were on a, uh, this battalion landing team. And then a second battalion, 26 Marines. And then toward the end, we, we went to, uh, we went to Okinawa and dropped off some amp tracks. And, uh, that's when I got, um, was my, my time was up. So then I, I came home from there. I didn't 
go back to Vietnam. But in, in, in right now, as we speak, there are battalion landing teams. They don't maybe call them, they call them Marine Expeditionary Units now, but they're off the coast. Of, they, they leave the West Coast and they leave the East Coast and they go for six months and they, they basically floating around the world doing the same things that we did. Uh, obviously, there's, you know, the war and uh, current things that we have going on in Iraq and Afghanistan, but um, there's people floating around uh, that are ready, ready to go. Yep. Yeah. And so, uh, like I said, and we would go and drop people off and go on an operation for 30, 30 days or 45 days and then come back to the ship and go back and forth and back and forth. So um, it's an interesting, <laughs> interesting experience. And like I said, I, I did what I, I, did, I just did my job. Yeah. You know. Well, can you tell me about Marble Mountain and maybe if you, if you grab uh, that or, or both of those things, I don't know if the Buddha was from Marble Mountain too, and, and, and like what was marble mountain and how did that play into so it was just uh it was just uh an area here that um uh was two mountains and in fact in marble mountain they had a uh they had i believe that they were it was an army unit that was on top of that mountain because this this mount marble You're mountain the u.s or the yeah no Vietnam. u.s okay u.s but there was a series of tunnels and caves inside that mountain, which the Viet Cong were in, and they would sneak out and and fire a few rockets at at the, the air facility. They would fire rockets at us, and I remember patrolling around there, and and uh, we're trying to find them all the time, and and uh, I, I don't remember ever finding anybody, and. Uh, there's another mountain, set of mountains, Chinstrap Mountain, which was next to it. But uh, anyways, in our little village, in this little ville right outside, it was called Nui Kim San, there was a gentleman, an old, an, an older guy that uh, uh, sat there, and, and he would make things out of marble. And one of the things I have here is a, it's a triangular piece of marble. Uh, it's something painted like black. Wedge, wedge or something. A wedge, like a wedge, like a pie, piece of pie wedge. And uh, I saw him, and he had these. He had, he had different things. He had like a he had like a little shop. I mean, it wasn't much. It was a, maybe the size of this table, and a little chair. And he had a, and he and he would carve this out. And I said, "This is what I want." And I, I have on uh, have my name on it: Paul S. Dostal, Marble Martin, Republic of Vietnam, or IVN. And I have a, a, an outline of Vietnam. It says Vietnam. 68, 69 on the left hand side, and on the right hand side, I have the Eagle Globe and Anchor, which is you know the Marine Corps emblem, and underneath it USMC, and this thing cost me uh, two or three dollars to have them make this. Unbelievable. And uh, so uh, I just thought I just thought it was really cool to have, and it I've carry I've had it with me for for 50 years now, and um, I used to put it on my desk at. Uh, when I at work, different work places that I worked, and you know, I was I was very proud of the fact that I had, had served in the Marine Corps in Vietnam. And then the other thing that I I had made had is they they made these little Buddhas. <laughs> uh, so is that also marble? You I think, or I'm, more soapstone it's, it's, it's or something? It's kind of a like a soapstony Maybe. material, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if I, I I'm not sure where I got it. I thought I got it there, but it could be some. And uh, so they used to say, you know, rub his head, and rub his belly, and that was that was good luck. So. <laughs> You know, some of us had these, had these, you know, these uh, different uh, theories or uh, can't think of the term, good luck charm type things mm -hmm. that that you had. And uh, now, what footwear do you have in that box over there? Also, I have uh, my jungle boots uh, that I wore. I got uh, issued two pairs, and uh, they said you could take a pair home, but I I, I think I took two pair home. Uh, so I had those. And, and they're that, kind of like a like a well, it's a it's a rubber canvas topped yes. canvas top and a, a rubber sole a rubber sole kind of like a big work boot yeah kind of like a big work boot and uh, black on the bottom and then the so canvas is, so is that actually a bit of leather the yeah the, the bottom part is the leather and they had uh, they had these uh, little holes on the side so that if you were like in a swamp or something, 
But we had so much sand around our area that so sand like used to get in there. So more what we, than being able to string them up yeah, or something, so, right? So we would, uh, uh, I, we would so, we soldered ours up because it, sand kept getting in, and we weren't in a lot of jungle area. And so I said, why, why are we doing this? But anyways, so the sand would get out, but uh, they were they were pretty comfortable, and they uh, supposedly had a. Uh, I haven't taken this pair apart, but I've seen them. They, they were uh, maybe a, a metal plate in here that uh, would protect your foot if you stepped on a, a pun, what they call the punji stick. Uh, a, what's, what's a punji stick? Which was a, uh, a sharpened bamboo stake that uh, the Vietnamese, the, the, the VC would, would put as a booby trap. Set along a trail or something. Setting on a trail or a, a path or some kind of thing. So I had these, and the other thing I have is a, uh, we call the bush hat, a jungle camouflaged bush hat that uh, they they issued. Oh, however, uh, maybe some of the uh, recon units that were, uh, or you see like now today you see Navy SEALs wearing these, but our our CO, our commanders were very adamant about wearing a helmet, wearing a flak jacket. Not only wearing the flak jacket, but buttoning it up because there were a number of people that they had a flak jacket on, but they might have had it not buttoned up. In fact, I think I had a picture here that I was showing you earlier. Here I am sitting on the, the front of that Amtrak. I got my flak jacket on and a T-shirt, but I don't have it buttoned up all the way. And I, I mean, of course, we were in a, you know, we were pretty secure there at that particular time. But if you went out. Uh, they were there for. I, I can recall they were people there getting, for a reason. You know, having it buttoned up, and and uh, uh, CEO would want to. He would want to find people twenty five dollars for, you know, not buttoning it up. And it was, you know, it was the point was it was going to save your life if, if right. something happened. Right. And then I also have a, a pair of uh, camouflaged uh, utilities, a working uniform that we had. That I had, um, that I I sent home. Uh, it's just a uh, kind of a quick drying pair of utilities with the large cargo pockets on so the side. So it's like a green camo, green pattern. camo pattern uh, jacket and and the trousers. And then um, also here, what I have, I can just show you how industrious the Vietnamese people were. Was a pair of Ho Chi Minh sandals. <laughs> They're made of a they actually took a tire and cut it out into a... So would that have been like from U.S. military yeah, tire Yeah, it could have been. It could, could have, have prob been. probably was a, uh, some old tires that the military threw away. I, I don't remember that. You know, I mean, as, as you drive down the street here in, in, in Hatfield or any city in America, you know, there's two or three cars in people's parking yards. They, they, when you walk down through this village of Nui Kim San, there weren't any cars. There weren't any. There might have been a, maybe a little motor scooter, like a little motorcycle a type of thing, or a bicycle. But this obviously came from a tire, which probably, possibly came from a military discarded tire. Uh, and they were very ingenious, and they made a pair of sandals out of it. And uh, so I said, "These are pretty cool. I got to get up here." And I think these were probably a dollar or something. And and uh, now, did you ever wear them? Not very much. I, I, I had them, and uh, I think I sent them home, and I mm -hmm. bought them, and I think they were probably in a in a box. And, uh, my mother had them at her house, and, and when I came back, and often when I got married and stuff, she said, Take you got to start getting your stuff out. So <laughs> uh, I had those, uh, but uh, no, I don't think I really wore them very much, but I just had them because I thought they were pretty cool. So I want to ask you just a few things. So, like, when you first got over there, um, so, like, how could you tell, like, if you're out patrolling or you're going through villages, I mean, uh, who was a friend and who was not as far as, like, Viet Cong or whatever? Well, d during the daytime, um, it, it was it was hard to tell. They weren't very, you, you weren't, uh, you know, they, they just, most of the people wanted to seem to go about their business. And... Uh, like I said, you, you uh, in, in our particular area, 
there wasn't a lot of I, I don't recall a lot of daytime activity uh, interaction or firing or, or anything like that. So was, like some bases would have like maybe Vietnamese women would come in and change the sheets or do well no we didn't people. have you didn't have any maids or anything we did have them we did have people that came in uh, through the gate they used to come through after all the security and, and the, like, like talked earlier about clearing the, the road and everything and there were people that came in <clears throat> that uh, worked in the mess hall uh, I think there was a, a, a we had a Vietnamese barber we had a little PX if you will a, a, like a little a store that you could buy excuse me some like shaving gear and uh, the basic the basic things for you and uh, not a lot of food options uh, they, there was a but and they had a little barber shop there and they had a little laundry that uh, a laundry service uh, because we didn't have washer dryers. If you wanted to wash your clothes, you had either had to get, get a bucket and do everything by hand. So I thought, That's and, crazy. and it was it was very inexpensive. Uh, and, and so the first time I I said, well, I'll have some of my unif- my these work uniforms, and I had it done once, and they came back. They were they looked they were folded nice, and they looked clean. They smelled horrific. They, I, I don't know where they washed them. They probably washed them in a ditch. Uh, but it, it was just, <laughs> it was, it, I, I, so what I started doing was we had a, we had shower hours. <laughs> I, I would take a, I would, I, I would either walk in there with, with socks and underwear. And while I'm taking a shower, I would wash my, wash my clothes, wash them and bring them back and kind of hang them, hang them up around uh, our, where we lived and then maybe on a on a you know it was not like it was like on a weekend that seemed like it was uh if I was in that p- particular when I was in the, my first base there um get a bucket and rinse everything out wash it and then string up a little line and and hang up your clothes and do do it yourself because it was it <laughs> Like well, I said, it seems it was, like you guys must have been pretty smelly. Yeah, it was. It was, um, you know, a lot of times you were, a, you didn't. When we went to work, you didn't have to wear your, you know. Normally, we didn't wear a flak jacket and your helmet. You wore uh, this, this, the, the jacket top, or just just a t shirt and a soft cover and a pair of trousers and boots. So, uh, yeah, you, you, it just was the way it yeah, was. It was the way it was. You know, right. not as opposed yeah. to like. Uh, I had friends that were in the infantry, and they were just out in the out in the bush, so to speak, day in and day out. They didn't have the luxury of of being in a battalion area and sleeping under a, you know, a, uh, they were sleeping under a shelter half or sleeping under nothing. So um, that's just the way it was. Yeah. So do you remember any uh, humorous things happening in the time well, you were there? Um, one of, one of the things that happened, I can remember being on guard duty one night. And it's it's. I look back; it's kind of humorous now. It wasn't humorous at the time. Uh, is uh, so there were maybe three or four of us in a in a bunker, and uh, you know, so we were there from like probably eight o'clock till eight o'clock in the morning or whatever. And everybody would take a little shift. You'd know, be up for a couple hours and then wake somebody else up. And so uh, we were we were sleeping. There was one guy who was on duty. And uh, he has M16 looking out, and it was all, like I said, it was all Sienia stuff. And he fell asleep, and the muzzle of his weapon had fallen into the dirt. And I don't know what time it was, but it was, you know, early in the morning, two, three o'clock in the morning. We started getting f- f- uh, 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 incoming fire. And of course, we all woke up and we started returning fire. And he goes to fire his weapon, and all of a sudden, boom! And his rifle was the barrel was full of dirt because he had fallen asleep, and his weapon just the barrel just kind of exploded. And it, like I said, it, it wasn't funny at the time, but after we were all laughing, like, <laughs> what were you doing? <laughs> uh, so, uh, what well, you said there was something about an outhouse? Oh yes, uh, there was another time. Uh, that every day you were assigned some type of, of duty, and uh, of course for our our 
uh, bathroom facilities consisted of a, a tube in the ground uh, for for urinating, and then uh, an old like an old fashioned outhouse, one or two holes in it, generally two holes, a two what they called a two, two holder. holder, and uh, and uh, so you went there, you did your business, and there was a fifty five gallon drum underneath with with diesel fuel in it, and every day. Those drums, that half drums, have to be pulled out, stacked up, and we would start them on fire and burn the waste, so to speak. And at some point, I guess they had to be buried. But I only did this a few times. But um, so one time, I, I, you know, and everybody hated this duty. At I'm least sure. I did because it was disgusting. And uh, so we we uh, I stacked up all these half. You know, you put maybe bunch of barrels because you'd have maybe several outhouses in a row and you'd stack them all up you know a a base then you stack a couple more and and i said we're gonna have a fire today and i poured a lot of fuel on there (laughs) (laughs) and we lit it and we had this fire and the next thing you know is one of the outhouses caught on fire (laughs) and we just kind of walked away and I, i don't recall what the result was but you know we didn't do it we we were over there somewhere but we burned an outhouse down and it was kind of joke of the day or joke of yeah. the week so what about on the other end of things i mean um <clears throat> like what do you remember witnessing you mentioned something about um there was a um uh, we were on a particular operation and on that operation there was a a lot of mines, a lot of minefields. In fact, there were a lot of a lot of Marines that got very, very seriously injured um, uh, from stepping on landmines. And uh, so, up from our battalion, and one of these particular amp tracks was was outfitted with a was a, was a mine clearing amp track. It had kind of a big plow on the front of it, and then it also had uh, a platform in it that raised up, and they would shoot out this explosive it was like bricks of c4 and they would shoot this out <coughs> into a, a, the minefield and detonate it from you know i, I forgot I, I don't know all the specifics of how far away you could do this but um so they sent this amp this amp track came down we were on this operation and uh one of my my friends was the radio operator his name was martin gilbert he's from the west he was from virginia and uh, I had just got finished. I, I did some repairs on the radios, and I gave them some extra handsets, brand new handsets. And so they were going out to clear this minefield, and uh, we were we were quite a ways away. Um, I don't know when I say quite a ways away, you know, several hundred yards away. And uh, so they were gonna they were gonna there was a, I think a, a lieutenant in there and four or five Marines inside the CM track. And like I said, it, it had like an elevator in it and it came up and then it would shoot off this, it was like a like a rope with all these bricks attached to it into the minefield and um, something happened and that prematurely detonated and it just blew that tractor to smithereens. Like you could see... Uh, a big ball of fire. Uh, I was sitting on an Amtrak manning the radios and I could hear over the, the traffic, you know, Corman up, Corman up, Corman up. And that's that's all you could hear. But it's, we didn't know what had happened because we, we couldn't actually... Right, you don't know if it had been blown up by somebody else. We didn't know else. if it had blown up and it was found out later on that it, it was uh, prematurely, something happened and that prematurely detonated before... That either it was coming up or it was sitting on top, and they were getting ready to launch it. But it, uh, so everybody died. Everybody died. I think there was five or six people that died oh. in that thing, and it was. And I mean, there was nothing left. There was nothing left. Uh, it was. It was terrible. And the other things that I remember was um, uh, in our battalion. Uh, the first time uh, we had some Marines that were outside. I don't know if they were on an Amtrak or on a patrol. It was when I first got there, and they had gotten they had gotten killed, and uh, we had a, a big ceremony, and it 
um, where they put their boots out and they, they stick their weapon in a sandbag and their helmets on top of the, and they, you know, they read off their names and um, just, you know, it, even if you didn't know them, it just really struck home to you that, uh, you know, this is a dangerous place and you've got to be thinking all the time. Uh, you got to be thinking about what you're doing and where you're going and where you're walking. And um, I called it situational awareness. And uh, I was always worried when I was a squad leader out taking these guys out at night that, you know, I'm responsible for for these 12 other, 11, 12 other people. And uh, thank God. We're I, also all just yeah, 20 years you know, old. I think the average age of us was was uh, probably 19 or 20 years old of all, if you collectively took all the average age of all the military people in Vietnam was, we were a bunch of kids, <laughs> really kids. And uh, so that was, that was, you, you tried not to dwell on that. You know, you tried to, tried to think about other things and that sort of stuff. So, but try to move on. Always keep moving forward. What have you done? I mean, have you at all connected with the military since you've been back? I mean, I know you. Yeah, I know you uh, post post Vietnam, like I said, I went to college and then I um, became an officer in 1974 and then uh, retired in, at the end of 1993. So I had 20, 20, 25, 26 years total time reserve and active, uh, uh, 20, almost and, 27 and years. And what was your rank when you retired? I retired as a lieutenant colonel. And then, uh, yeah, I'm I'm associated with our local uh, American Legion post. Um, we have a small post here in Hatfield. And um, how many years have you been associated? with I, them, I've been know? associated. I, I moved back here in 1993, and I joined then, so 20, 25 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, we pay tribute to all of our veterans in town every Memorial Day. We have a parade every Memorial Day. And you've been the master of ceremonies yeah, for been, that for yeah well, many, you know, years, how many years, about, probably about twenty years. There was a uh, an Air Force lieutenant colonel that lived in town. Um, I can't pronounce his last name, but um, he's since he did it for a number of years. Um, and then he, when I came to town, he said, "I got a job for you." <laughs> he says, "It's not very high paying, but you can have it." Because I'm I'm getting ready to retire, and, and he passed away shortly. Uh, I, I can't remember his name can't pronounce his name but uh he was a very nice man and uh, so i've been doing that and i i like doing it and i really thank the our veterans i think the people in hatfield uh, appreciate our veteran service um our, our veterans and i this particular year we have uh i always try to get find out if somebody from high school is is going into the military and uh, try to recognize them at Memorial Day. We do have one young man that's going into the service, into the Marine Corps, actually, after graduation, but he he didn't show up. I don't know if he was out of town or, or whatever. Day, on the, just, just Who, the, who's that? No, it's a, a young man named Carter Woodward. Mm -hmm. Carter Woodard. And uh, he just graduated last week. And, uh, you know, we, we would like to have him join our, our group when he comes back and we do have two other Marines, so Mike Malloy and his brother uh, Cam Woodard, uh, that actually have been part participating in the parade with us. So we're trying to we're trying to get the young people in into our fold because um, it's been very very important uh, for the residents and to to I think keep this uh, military tradition going. And not saying that everybody has to go in. We have a very very small percentage. Like 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 what one per, less than one or about one percent of the population now is uh, in the military, and it's um, you know for whatever's happened over these years, it's just a different world that we live in. But I, I think that uh, I think it's important. To, I think there's some service to our our country. We have a, just a wonderful country here, and uh, I think it's it's a, very important to me, and I think a lot of other of us that have have served before us and. Uh, to enjoy the freedoms that we enjoy. So, um, so I do, I do have some, some contact with, uh, some people that I served with, uh, a few years, a couple years ago, I, I, uh, I served with, uh, a gent, uh, David Cox. He was <laughs> like me, had stuff stored in a box and he lived out in Seattle, Washington. And he contacted me and, uh, actually sent me a couple pictures of, of him and I in Vietnam. And, uh, uh, 
correspond with Christmas cards and things like that. But and there's another another kid, another guy that I knew in Boston that uh, you know we we correspond once in a while. But um, other than that, uh, Memorial Day. But you, you think about every once in a while, you think about all these all these people that served and like like myself and many others. Um, we just went around and we got on with our lives and got married and had a family, have grandchildren and um, part of history. <laughs> yep. Part of history. So. Um, well, I want to thank you so much for participating and talking with me today. Um, I think it's a story that needs to be told and I'm very glad to have you tell it. And I, I think we probably go on for a few more hours, but. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I'm glad that uh, I could contribute to the legacy of the Vietnam veterans, and I'm glad that uh, that you have taken the initiative and the time to take an interest in our Vietnam veterans. And as we both know, that um, we're getting older, <laughs> we're losing. Uh, we've lost most of our, I think, all of our World War II veterans here in Hatfield, and. Uh, many of our Korean War veterans and some of our Vietnam veterans, and um, uh, you know we're, we're that we're that generation now, right. and right. Uh, I think this is an excellent way of preserving that history. And um, you know, uh, we and people go back and they say, "What was it like? What was it like?" And I mean, here we have this uh, tribute to uh, one of Hatfield's own, Marion Billings, a hundred years ago, and. People are, you know, thinking about that, and hopefully, in fifty and, or a hundred years, they'll be listening right. to this. And, right. Um, or, what, or, what's um, we have her uh, journals and her diary, which makes it so that you can learn what her experience was like as a Red Cross yeah. canteen worker. But unfortunately, for the guys, for the soldiers, you know, we, you know, through lots of digging, have like just barely been able to find out for you know maybe a dozen of them what unit they served in and mm -hmm. maybe when they went in but yeah. no no details no you know yeah. by and large um yeah. uh except for like two of the guys who had articles and one guy did write a memoir um, yeah and so anyway, i don't so have a diary i didn't like now, a, didn't like you a, say you maybe kept a journal or something yeah i had or? a i had a little book because it had a lot of uh uh our radio frequencies and call signs and passwords and things of that nature, but uh, it, it still could be in my house or maybe it got discarded over one of my many moves when I moved all, all around, uh, but uh, I, I can't find it. <laughs> so maybe it'll turn up, maybe it won't. And, yeah. uh, but uh, I do have some pictures here that I can, I'd be more than happy to share with the, with the historical society and uh, my uniform and my jungle boots and the Ho Chi Minh sandals and willing to donate to the library or to the historical society That'd be for great. for uh, That'd be great. for those future generations coming up. Yeah. So, all right, thank all right. you very much for doing what you do. Thank you for your service. All right, thank you.